good. So let's keep going then with um, our 12 lead ECG discussion. We'll use this in lab this week. And on Thursday, we will finish up all the five elements that we can uh, that we can discern from our 12 lead ECG trace. So you have all the information going in, even though the machine that we have will predict based on the pattern what characteristics or abnormalities there might be. So the machine will predict it, but you will be able to confirm with your understanding of uh, what we're looking at in each of these five elements. So rate we've done, we're on to rhythm now. We'll talk about axis, uh, rotation, hypertrophy, and infarction later. Axis and rotation, I think about together as one item, which is why it sound, sounded like there were six when I listed them, but there's really only five. So rhythm is, does the ECG trace look regular? Are all the elements always present? If they're not, it's usually attributable to some form of block, some form of heart block. The signal either gets stopped in its tracks or gets slowed down. And we introduced the idea of heart block last week. There are different degrees at different locations, and today our task is to look at those locations and what a trace might look like if heart block occurred there at different degrees of severity. So the, uh, the most upstream form, the earliest form of heart block could be SA node block. SA node block. It can either be completely blocked, so whatever signals it originates don't get sent through to the atria or the ventricles. <coughs> Whatever the active potentials are, at whatever the rate, um, they occur in an isolated environment and don't propagate through the heart. Or the SA node might be suppressed. Sometimes it will release a signal. Sometimes it's overridden. That shouldn't happen. On the next slide that we look at, we, we saw uh, a schematic of this uh, last week as well. The SA node is the, the, um, at the top of the food chain. It overrides all the, other, um, all the other pacemaker sites in the heart. It should have the fastest rate, not be overridden, but sometimes the situation presents itself where it might be reset or suppressed by other foci in the heart. And it's really not a big deal. It's not life-threatening. Uh, the SA node dictates a normal resting heart rate, 40 to 60 beats per minute. Uh, no, uh, maybe 50 to 70 beats per minute. But if it fails, other locations in the heart can set a somewhat slower pace. The AV node, for instance, will set it at 40 to 60 beats per minute. It might even be a normal resting heart rate for some of you if you're elite athletes. Um, but other things can take over. It's not life-threatening. You can treat any severe cases with an artificial pacemaker. And we'll talk about this a fair bit. Artificial pacemaker is simply something that can be set to stimulate contraction at regular intervals. It can be implanted at different locations in the heart. Typically, the SA node or the AV node is really where those artificial pacemakers are required. Uh, it's not such a concern at the SA node because this is a mild form of blocker suppression. And it should make sense that it's somewhat mild because imagine the SA node doesn't work at all. Um, if other areas in the heart will take up the charge and produce a cardiac rhythm, the only thing we're missing out on here is the brief contraction of the atria and the extra loading of blood in the ventricles. If other locations in the heart take up the torch and initiate contraction, you still get pumping of blood through the body. It just might not be as much with every beat because you're not filling it to the brim uh, by contracting the atria. So SA block or SA suppression. This was the figure that I was referencing uh, just a minute ago. SA node should inherently override or suppress all of the other pacemaker cells in the heart. This has the fastest inherent pacing. And like we talked about last week, when a cell depolarizes and it sends the signal through the conduction pathway of the heart, it triggers depolarization in all the other cells. When they're depolarized, there's a refractory period where they can't be triggered again. 
And so this initial signal, this fast inherent pacing, will initiate the refractory periods in all of these other cells and essentially reset them. So they won't trigger on their own. They're dictated by the pace of the SA node. But in this case, there's some kind of detachment or delay, a bump in the road where the signal from the SA node doesn't get through or doesn't get through regularly or just gets through more slowly to the rest of the heart. So what, that, uh, what might that look like? We're going to look at three examples, traces of three examples. If the SA node isn't reliably conducting its signals to the uh, rest of the atria and the rest of the heart, we might observe what's called a wandering pacemaker. It's the most benign form of SA block or SA suppression. That can progress to multifocal atrial tachycardia, which in its most extreme form can present as atrial fibrillation. So the names describe a lot of what we're going to see. Wandering pacemaker is simply the pacemaker that initiates the cardiac rhythm, moves it around. We'll see how that's possible. Multifocal atrial tachycardia means there are essentially many SA nodes. Multifocal, many foci in the atrium or atria that are trying to initiate contraction and ends up being rather quick. Tachycardia means heart rate over 100 beats per minute. And I'll come back to all of this. Fibrillation, you've uh, probably heard about this, if not seen it expressed in the uh, TV shows or popular media, atrial fibrillation is just chaotic signals spread throughout the atria. So being that it's chaotic, it's probably most disruptive. Let's take a look at what each, each one of these looks like. So wandering pacemaker first. Wandering pacemaker. There's an inconsistency at the SA node. The signal to depolarize the heart moves around. It can start at the SA node, it might move to another location in the atria, and it might even be the AV node that takes up the, uh, the torch. So you can see this junctional rhythm, which simply means the rhythm to contract the heart starts at the junction between the atria and the ventricles. The junctional rhythm always means the AV node is initiating the cardiac cycle. That's the junction between the two halves of the heart. Also called a junctional escape rhythm sometimes. The AV node depolarizes. And what we're describing here is a situation where there's not just one um, origin for the signal to depolarize the heart. Normally that's the SA node. There's more than one. SA node, other areas, or the AV node. And because there's more than one, that means there's more than one location within the heart where the, uh, the contraction occurs, the vector is always changing. What do I mean by the vector is always changing? Well, the vector is from where the potential begins to where it travels. Imagine a straight line between those two, and that's the vector. It's the line between the point of origin and the end point where the signal goes. Normally, the SA node at the base or the top of the heart sends a signal straight through uh, the septum towards the other end of the lead to ECG. It's one vector. But if the SA node has another complementary node that's trying to activate the heart, that vector might shift. It might move around. And so if that moves around, the electrical activity will be picked up in a slightly different manner. The P wave changes shape. You can see short, spiky P waves. You can see long, rounded P waves. There are bimodal P waves, so it looks like there's two bumps. There are biphasic P waves. The P wave might go up and then down. There are many different kinds and shapes of P waves. And not only will the shape change, but depending on where it originates, it might take more or less time to move through the atria. 
the time, the duration, the, the width of the P wave might change, and the space between it and the QRS complex might change. So there's a big, there's a mismatch between the P waves and the QRS complexes. You can see an obvious arrhythmia. This isn't normal rhythm. Just look at the QRS complexes. They're, they're spaced uh, really close together here. They're, they're spaced a bit further apart. It's not regular and controlled, and the P waves occur at different regions. Sometimes they're overridden by the QRS complex. Sometimes it looks like they happen afterwards. And being that there's not this ordered hierarchy, SA node to the atria to the AV node and down, the, uh, the movement of the vector through the atria can result in the uh, junctional rhythm being obvious. So the AV node initiates depolarization of the heart on its own, which you can see pointed out on the slide. So disorganized relationship between the P wave and the QRS complex and the uh, regularity is affected. This is a miniature version of the, uh, the fibrillation that we'll see in a couple examples. This is almost, um, sometimes it can be uh, confused with fibrillation, but there's more order here, and we'll see that coming up in a second. In this case, there's always one location that's starting the cardiac cycle. It just moves around. SA node, atria, AV node. But it's still ordered. One place is trying to initiate contraction only. It just moves around. The difference between this next example and wandering pacemaker is that you have multiple foci trying to initiate the cardiac cycle but they are trying to fire at the same or at similar times. Whereas the wandering pacemaker, all the areas take turns. Multifocal atrial tachycardia is a situation where these foci don't take turns. They're all trying to initiate contraction at the same time. And we don't really know why this occurs it's a progressive aggravation of the SA node, and there's some indication that um, calcium is implicated. We'll often observe this in older adults with progressed COPD for some reason, and it's aggravated by one of the, the medications to relax and open up the airways. It's a, a theophylline derivative, which has a very similar structure to caffeine. And being that it has a similar structure to caffeine, it can help release more calcium in the cells. One of the reasons or one of the, the mechanisms of caffeine is it increases the release of um, calcium in the cells. It can augment contraction. And that might be good if you uh, want to wake up and go to the gym and you have a lot of activity to do. You want to be forcefully contracting. But it's not good in the heart where you need regular, normal intensity contractions that are spaced apart at appropriate intervals. So calcium overload seems to be implied. Think about the, the cells maybe being more sensitive. They have an itchy trigger finger and they might depolarize more spontaneously in a situation with calcium overload. Here we have um, more distinct P waves, multifocal atrial tachycardia multiple foci, and if you look closely on this figure, you can see many different P waves, and I'll highlight them for you here. There's wide, uh, rounded P waves on the left. There's a bimodal P wave in the middle. You can see the, the two little humps. And then that short, spiky P wave over on the right-hand side indicates that the signal to contract is at least coming from three different areas. Because when I pick it up, this is a, a standard lead two trace, as I observe in my lead to trace, I'm seeing the signal being sent in three different ways. That is, it takes on three different shapes. The electrical activity is traveling in three different paths or directions through the heart in three different manners. Multiple different P waves indicate the multifocal aspect 
of tachycardia. And then tachycardia comes about because the heart rate is quick. The signals get through, the ventricles contract, but the rhythm is really fast. It's kind of difficult to see the major grid lines, but this is 300, 150. This might be 155 beats per minute, according to the 300 rule. That's quick. And tachycardia simply indicates this is a heart rate over 100 beats per minute. If it were, uh, actually, I don't know what the, oh yeah, the normal word, the, the word for a normal pace is just rhythm. This would be multifocal atrial rhythm if it was between 60 and 100 beats per minute. And if it were really artificially slow, the complementary term to tachycardia is bradycardia or bradycardia for a slow heart rate. Multifocal atrial tachycardia just means multiple atrial foci depolarizing quickly, causing a fast heart rate. And this is what I mentioned earlier, worsened by a theophylline administration. It's in, uh, a treatment used for COPD to open up the airways that um, causes the accumulation of calcium and the increased sensitivity of these foci. So some similarities, but some key distinctions between this, these examples. The similarities, multiple foci, but the differences are the wandering pacemaker takes turns, multifocal atrial tachycardia. They are all trying to activate at once. And generally, these are a progression. So if you had um, a wandering pacemaker, it could progress to become aggravated and worsened insofar as multifocal atrial tachycardia. And then if left untreated, this can become atrial fibrillation, which is the continuous chaotic quivering of the atria. Electrical signals being sent everywhere in a disorganized manner and the signal not being conducted stepwise through the conduction system of the heart. So obvious difference in the appearance of the traces. Take a look at what atrial fibrillation means. It's pretty clear, even compared to the last example, which, yeah, it was quick. There are multiple foci, but at least it's ordered. Here, there's just no order. This um, squiggly scattered line indicates the baseline activity in the atria. It's quivering. There's always electrical signals being sent. It's chaotic. All of this activity overwhelms the SA node, so there's no ability for it to ever set the pace. It's always being overwhelmed by signals from other areas in the atria. And as such, there's no ordered passage of these signals, and so it's infrequent that the signal gets through the AV node to the ventricle. It doesn't always pass from the atria to the ventricle which starts to present a problem because if the atria are quivering and they're not functioning, okay, maybe if the rest of the heart is working, then we, we can still survive. We just won't pump as much blood with every beat. But if the signals are starting to be interrupted from getting through to the ventricles and we have this infrequent passage, now we have disorganized pumping of blood to the rest of the body. Now we might be uh, missing, we might not satisfy the needs for blood at all the tissues in the body. And so this could be a problem. Generally, the infrequent spikes are, uh, they present as an irregular R to R interval. That is from each QRS complex, the space between is Larger in some cases, smaller in others, but it's not consistent. But it's still, when the signal gets through, the rest of the system seems to work properly. The signal goes through quickly. The QRS complex is narrow. So at least the bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers, the rest of the conduction system seems to transmit the signal accordingly. It's just a matter of getting that signal through. 
is the chaotic activity in the atria that doesn't always get through easily. So you might be able to draw, actually it might take some imagination, to draw similarities between this and the wandering pacemaker. So the, the irregularity is similar, but certainly the baseline activity is much different, and the infrequent passage is a bit different as well. Large S waves in this example, which we're not sure what that means yet. Yeah? So, so these large downward spikes are the QRS complexes. They're just being overridden, or, or they are the, the electrical activity seems to be more prominent on the S wave or the downstroke for whatever reason. But these large deflections are the ventricular contraction. Just like in the middle example, these large deflections are the ventricular contraction. Um, they're the most clearly defined aspect of the of the trace. Is that is that what you're asking? Yeah, I was just like, what is a large S wave? <laughs> we'll we'll see um, what a large S wave means shortly. Yeah. So we're using these as examples to show just atrial disorganization, but there might be other things at play. The heart might not function perfectly. There might be other things that are limiting or, or changing the signal that we're observing. Big negative S wave deflection is coming up later. It's uh, one of the characteristics of hypertrophy. Yeah. Would you see them then on passage if you're asking the student to like score one for each of these and then like can you trace the atrial fibrillation and um, the wandering pacemaker and the heart rate rate and see if the wandering pacemaker and the heart rate if you would observe a passage of one for each of these things and then if one of these hadn't been passed you wouldn't trace it then. Would it be wrong if you were trying to do that? Uh, if I were to ask you, for example, on a test and then show you something, it's pretty obvious which is which. So yes, they're irregular. The QRS complexes are spaced out differently. The big difference is the, um, the site that initiates contraction moves around in an ordered manner. So the P wave exists. It's quiet. There's no activity between um, cardiac events, it just moves around, whereas the fibrillation is characterized by constant low-grade chaotic activity in, in the atria. There's always something fluctuating, there's always a cardiac cycle trying to initiate, there's this quivering of the atria that sometimes sends signals through. So the similarity is sometimes the signals go through, they just go through irregularly. The differences are one at a time, the pacemakers line up and then initiate firing in a different order. There's no order here. The atria are just always on. Yeah. yeah. With the atrial fibrillation, is it always going to have the large uh, passages? Good question. In the examples that I've seen, yes. I'm not going to say that that will always be the case. Um, if this looked similar with a, a, a squiggly, like active baseline, with some chaotic P waves that you might be able to pick out, and this were an upwards deflection, I think you should still be able to figure out that it's atrial fibrillation. But the examples that I have show it, I only have one or two, but they show it like this. So I'm going to say no, it won't always present with a large downwards deflection. OK. So the SA node wasn't doing its job in any of these cases to regularly depolarize, and then get the rest of the cells in line. Each of these examples was a progressively worse situation where the rest of the cells were rebelling against the SA node. They were either doing it in an orderly manner, they were all trying to do it at once, and now this is just pandemonium. As far as the SA node suppression goes, or block at the SA node, that's generally what will occur. And there's probably other examples, but for our purposes, in one week discussing it in a one semester course, we're leaving it there. Certainly, you can spend an entire semester looking not only at the heart and 12 lead ECGs, but you can think of the electrical activity in a lot of depth as well. But if the SA node 
is blocked or suppressed, uh, other atrial foci should take over, and they might um, intermingle with some junctional or the AV node foci or depolarizations of time as well. But what if not only the SA node is affected, but what if somehow the heart, the two chambers, the two halves of the heart are disconnected? So the atria are trying to send a signal, whether it be ordered or not. The ventricles are just not receiving that signal. So what if there's a block between the signal passing through the atria, going through the junction, and then heading to the rest of the ventricles? In that case, you might have disorganized pumping of the atria on one hand, the ventricles on the other, and these can be completely separate. And if they are completely separate, that's an example of third degree block, which is uh, really bad, and generally you die if you don't have a pacemaker. We'll talk about that. That's, that's what we're moving towards in this exam. <clears throat> so if the signal from the atria is not getting through, and if the, uh, the AV node and the ventricles are charged with setting cardiac rhythm, it can happen in a couple different ways. The junction initiating cardiac rhythm isn't ideal, but it's survivable. And the most obvious or the simplest example of this is shown here with constant junctional rhythm. I was going to ask you what the defining characteristic of this was, but it says it up here on the slide. There's no P wave. So in this trace, there's no SA node depolarization. There's no contraction of the atria. You're only getting the QRS complex onwards. No P waves. Cardiac rhythm, regular heartbeat, is set by the AV node in this case. This is also called junctional escape rhythm, a regular junctional escape rhythm. The AV node only is depolarizing. And this tells us that the two are detached. They're decoupled. And I'll show you why by contrasting it with a similar example. Here, the junction still initiates contraction, but a key difference is that there are P waves, they're just upside down. What does an upside down P wave tell us about what's happening in the atria? What does an upside down wave tell us about electrical flow in the heart? Yep. Negative what? Negative direction. Okay, so in the opposite direction yeah. is what you're is what you're getting at. Absolutely. <laughs> a positive wave towards a positive electrode gives an upwards deflection positive wave towards a negative electrode gives a downwards deflection. So the atria are depolarizing. They're just not doing it towards the apex. They're doing it towards the base. They're doing it backwards. So the junctional rhythm sets the pace of the heart. The signal goes from the AV node through the ventricles like you would expect. The QRS complex is normal. But it goes backwards through the atria. So in the, in the first example, where there's no P wave, the signal's not going through the atria. That's why we think they're decoupled. In the second example, something's happening where the SA node, the atria, aren't firing. The AV node sets the pace. It's still connected to the atria. The signal's just going in the opposite direction. So the two halves of the heart are decoupled in the first example. They're connected in the second example, but something is wrong that the atria aren't firing. So these are the simplest examples of when the AV node might initiate contraction. This is what you could hope for, um, the, the best you could hope for with a junctional rhythm. It gets increasingly more complicated and more life-threatening as we move through. <clears throat> 
Where it becomes <clears throat> a concern is when the signal that's being delivered to the, uh, the AV node doesn't consistently pass through. So there's disconnection between the atria and the ventricles. The signal doesn't get through. It's not relayed efficiently or at all. And the degree of the blockage dictates the degree of AV block. And I, I use the word block to describe itself in that situation, but the degree of the impairment um, is described here, showing the, the progressively uh, worse form of blocks as you move through. So first degree AV block, AV block is generally just a delay in the signal. The signal is slowed down too much. The job of the AV node is to slow down the signal a bit, but if it slows it down too much, it's a mild form of AV block. If conduction sometimes doesn't get through, it's a slightly more impactful form of AV block. If it's always blocked, if the signal never gets through, so if the SA node is trying to contract the heart, trying to initiate a cardiac rhythm, but there's complete disconnect, and the AV node is not working, you never get pumping of the ventricles, you never get blood flow, and you don't live long. So you need an intervention in that third case in order to live, and we'll see what that looks like. So in order of increasing severity, if the AV node is not working optimally, in that it delays the signal too long, we can observe that on a trace with an artificially long PR interval. And the PR interval should normally be small, narrow. One or two small boxes, maybe 80 milliseconds. In this case, the PR interval, 200 milliseconds. Anything over one large box in size indicates some delay, an artificially long delay at the AV node. And we would characterize this as first degree AV block. This in itself is not a problem yet. If the block gets longer, or if the block stops being a delay and then the signal doesn't get through, then it might become a problem. But simply as a long PR interval, not a huge deal. The signal's just delayed, but the elements, the, the areas of the heart still contract in turn. Sometimes this can progress. And let me, let me just make a point about um, the progression of first degree block before we move on. Generally, you'll see normal PR intervals that will eventually elongate more and more over time. So as this situation worsens, the PR interval gets longer. If the PR interval um, gets too long, sometimes a, uh, the signal might not get through. And this is where the disease or the condition progresses to second AV block, where there's intermittent blockage. The signal isn't just delayed, but it stops getting through or it doesn't get through the AV node. And you can see a measure of the PR interval in each case. This is uh, not a static suppression. There's something incremental happening where the delay gets longer and longer and longer. And when it's too long, the atria contract, they fire, but then nothing happens. The AV node doesn't relay the signal. And so we have a skipped beat in this case. Even this is not a concern for what it represents at this point in time. It's a concern for what it might progress to, but if you're only skipping the odd beat here and there, overall on average, your heart rate, your normal heart rhythm, might be 68 beats per minute instead of 69. Not a big deal overall. But it's important for what it might progress to. You don't see this very often. Uh, if you do see it, 
mention, you might see it as morbid type 1, and put that out there to contrast to the next example that we're going to see, which is more common, or the Wenkenbach version of second degree AB block. If you ever see it referenced in such a way, you'll know what you're talking about. Excuse me. This progressive delay, the elongation of the PR interval, and then the occasional skipped beat. This is somewhat predictable. Where this um, second degree AV block becomes a concern is not where there's the, this progressive delay that results in the occasional skip beat, but where there is fixed non-conduction. Where there's a predictable um, non-relay or, or um, impassage of the signal from the atria to the ventricle. And you can see in this case, this has progressed fairly far. There are three atrial contractions for every uh, ventricular contraction. This is regular, fixed, predictable non-conduction. Something is wrong intrinsically with the AV node or maybe um, the bundle branches, uh, the Hisperkinji cells at the AV node. Something is wrong with those where they either have a really long refractory period or they can't clear calcium out in time. Something doesn't allow them to contract in response to the signals they receive from the atria. Regular, fixed, non-conduction through the AV node. So already here you can see the, the cardiac output, the ability of the heart to pump blood to the body, severely limited. Instead of 70 beats per minute, you might have 30 effective contractions that deliver heart or deliver blood to the rest of the body. Deliver blood by the heart to the rest of the body. This can very quickly deteriorate into complete block. You can already imagine this is hanging on by a thread. There are three uh, P waves for every QRS complex. As it worsens, there might be four. There might be five. At some point, there will be complete non-conduction. The atria are trying as hard as they can to send signals through. The ventricles aren't hearing it. And so with complete non-conduction, what I'm describing is third degree AV block. No signal gets through. Ventricles do not contract. No blood is pumped. And so if you don't preemptively treat this, you die. Complete heart block or decoupling of the two halves of the heart, the atria and the ventricles. If you don't treat it, and treatment here is an artificial pacemaker at the AV node where you stimulate the escape rhythm, you stimulate the junctional rhythm artificially, if you don't do that, you die. So how is it possible that I have an ECG trace up here to discuss with you? Certainly anyone with third degree heart block or AV block would be dead and wouldn't have an ECG trace to show. This is a treated individual with third degree AV block. This is post pacemaker. What you can see are two completely separate rhythms. So as AV block progresses, the, the P wave, the atria, are sending signals regularly, but the ventricles aren't hearing them. You need to force contraction of the ventricles. We can see the P waves contracting normally. Normal atrial rhythm in this example. And it's difficult to, to pick them out. You're going to ask yourself, how did you know to put one of these rectangles here? How do you know that's a P wave? How do you know P waves in here? Thankfully, PowerPoint will, um, when, you, when you can find individual P waves and you line up the blocks on top of the P waves, it'll snap the blocks into position when you have the equal distance between the blocks. So that's the secret to finding the P wave hidden within this uh, 
this T wave in the middle or hidden within the QRX, uh, QRS complex at the left. This is regular P to P interval, regular atrial contraction that's matched by the artificial pace set at the AB node by a pacemaker. R to R intervals, you don't really need to worry about uh, them being hidden. They're the most obvious element on the trace. This is the R to R interval inter um, representing ventricular contraction, and this is set by the artificial pacemaker. Two completely distinct rhythms, beating out of time, but getting the job done. Third degree heart block treated third degree heart block. You can't see third degree heart block in the wild. Make sense? So these are examples at the AV node specifically. Either it works and there's no upstream signal, which were the first two examples, or there's a deficiency with the AV node itself. It takes too long to conduct the signal, it's not relaying the signal, and it's completely disconnecting the two halves of the heart. So that's the AV node specifically, but that doesn't address the idea that the rest of the cells in the ventricles may spontaneously depolarize. There are ventricular foci, just like there are atrial foci, but these rarely come into play because of their incredibly slow rate of spontaneous depolarization. Yet, we can observe some uh, examples of where this might occur, where the ventricular tissue might depolarize. And there are a few one-off examples where it does occur. There's a few examples where, um, well, you'll see coming up. When might the ventricles depolarize? If they aren't receiving an upstream signal and they are given the opportunity, the tissue itself can depolarize. And we can see the most common example is a premature ventricular contraction. Now, higher level athletes will often see this with a very low resting heart rate, with the cardiac rhythm spaced out over a long period of time, there's more opportunity for the ventricular tissue to depolarize. And if it does, you get this large fluctuation as the muscle of the ventricles depolarizes and contracts prematurely without getting a signal from upstream in the heart. It spreads through the walls of the ventricles, squeezing the ventricles, and then normal sinus rhythm uh, picks up shortly afterwards. This is non-life-threatening. It's very, very common in a study of 100 normal individuals over just 24 hours. 39 had at least one premature ventricular contraction, and four of them had 100, to give you a sense of how common these are. You might not even know if you have a premature ventricular contraction. It might just feel like a brief shock, or who knows what, but they're common. They're common, they return to normal shortly afterwards. One characteristic of this trace that might help understand what they are is um, the width of the QRS complex. Notice this is very wide. The sine wave is spread out. And this is indicative of the signal spreading through the tissue and not through the conduction system not through the nerves in the heart. So spreading the potential through neighboring myocytes is slow. It's a very slow process. It happens, and it can spread over the entire ventricles, and they'll contract. It just it, uh, presents as a drawn-out, elongated QRS complex. Whereas the normal rhythm shows very quick conduction down the septum, around the sides, through the, uh, the, uh, um, the nerves in the walls, through the Purkinje fibers, very quick conduction through the cardiac conduction system. But when it's drawn out and spread apart like this, it's indicative of the signal moving through the tissue proper. 
So single premature ventricular contractions, not dangerous. There might be brief oxygenation problems, but overall, not a big deal. If they happen regularly, it's what we would describe as an idioventricular rhythm, an abnormal rhythm originating from the ventricles. And you can think of this as essentially a regular premature ventricular contraction. Rather than this being a one-off, you being one of these uh, 39 individuals that had one PVC, the four individuals that had 100 are more likely exhibiting an idioventricular rhythm. Whatever the cause, there is the occasion for a slow heart rate to allow the ventricle tissue to depolarize. Whatever the cause. Could be damage to one of the nodes, could be a delay in the conduction, but there's regular ventricular depolarization. And again, you can see the somewhat wide PRS complex. It's not as obvious here, but certainly this is wider than a normal QRS complex which these individuals will also exhibit. Uh, these are the highlighted regular PBCs, just a, a large disruption in the normal electrical signals, the heart or the ventricular tissue contracting, but overall still not life-threatening. There's just regular passage of these signals through the tissue of the ventricles. Where it does become life-threatening, is where we lose the organization that we can see on this slide. There's some aberrations in each trace, but they are regular. There is normal rhythm in and surrounding these aberrations. If the conduction in the heart becomes irregular and uncoordinated, This is where we run into life-threatening, quick, sudden cardiac death situations. So ventricular flutter is an example of a cardiac condition where the ventricles are trying to initiate the cardiac cycle. They're not doing it slowly. They're doing it very quickly. And because it's a relatively large portion of the heart, there's a lot of tissue there, the signal is equally large. And the flutter indicates almost rhythmic pulsing of the ventricles. They're trying to pulse. They're not giving uh, enough time to fill between pulses. This regular flutter is indicative of this sine wave of electrical activity that we see here. And there's no P wave. There's no baseline. There's no QRS complex. This is regular, large, rhythmical contraction of the ventricles and the whole heart uh, at once. I think of this as sort of what would happen if the atrial fibrillation always got a signal through. There's this low level vibrating or quivering of the heart tissue. And with atrial fib, there was inconsistent passage of the signals through the AV node. So if it always got a signal through, you have this really high baseline of activity, and there's always some signal getting through, it's still disorganized, it's chaotic, there's this large rhythmic attempt to pulse and beat and then deliver blood to the body. But clearly, the order is gone. There's no directionality for the electrical activity in the heart. There's no sequencing of events in the heart and blood flow is compromised. This is difficult to observe because it often progresses to quick, sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is another word for ventricular fibrillation. So like atrial fibrillation, where you have that buzzing in the atria, now, instead of wide rhythmic pulsing of the ventricles and the atria of the heart as a whole, 
you get the vibrating throughout the entire heart. There's no contraction. There's signals spiking and moving everywhere, but they don't culminate in the heart doing anything. At least with flutter, there was the occasional ejection of blood. With fibrillation, there's really no contraction. The heart is just tonic. So ventricular fibrillation. This is chaotic, turbulent electrical activity. Persistent tension in the cardiac muscle. But little contraction and relaxation. There's no pulsing. There's no contraction. Just tension. This is also referred to as cardiac arrest. The heart is in arrest. It's not functioning. It's not contracting. And this requires defibrillation, a la Gray's Anatomy or ER or any other situation that you've seen it, with the, the paddles, the electrode gel, with the large um, external electrical stimulus, which when applied to the heart, hopefully induces all cells to enter their refractory periods. And we're hoping that normal rhythm uh, develops shortly afterwards. That the SA node can once again take over after everything's been reset and there's no conflicting signals. We're jump-starting the heart, and we hope that the normal sinus rhythm will occur once again. That's the only way to reverse something like this. So why would this ever happen? Ventricular foci have a very slow, spontaneous depolarization rate. They should always be overridden by something. The AV node, the atria, the SA node. Why would they activate? A lot of the time, this will occur with damage. Damage can be infarction, so reduced blood supply to the heart. It can be... Um, necrosis or, or, or tissue uh, death from previous infarction, something to do with a reduced delivery of oxygen. And if that happens in heart tissue, the, um, the effects are not well tolerated. So in the body, in muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, if you don't deliver enough oxygen, well, you have substrate level phosphorylation that can take over intermittently glycolysis, phosphocreatine, you can still make energy, and it's not persistent. You don't have uh, a complete abrupt loss of oxygen. In the heart, if you do, and if you have that substrate level phosphorylation, what often happens is calcium release will, calcium is released in larger quantities and not recycled as quickly. So you have this heightened sensitivity, lots of calcium available where the ventricular tissue can easily contract. So it's becoming uh, easier to spontaneously contract the ventricles. This is a situation where potassium comes into play. And I mentioned briefly when we talked about the, uh, the cardiac cycle, and I'm highlighting again here that it's really beyond the scope of the course, but any disturbance in normal potassium has a strong effect on cardiac signals, whether it be low potassium or high potassium. The amount of potassium in the blood is described as kalemia. Hypokalemia is low potassium. Hyperkalemia is high potassium. Normokalemia is normal potassium. If blood potassium is too low, Remember, we don't like potassium in the blood. It's not supposed to be outside the cells, but there's some. If there's too little, membrane potential rises. There's less positive stuff outside, more inside. The, the differential is larger. 
and that can affect the ability of the, the cells to spontaneously contract. Whereas on the flip side, if it's too high, it will oppose the, uh, normal, ca uh, the normal potassium leak and again, reduce spontaneous depolarization. If it moves too far in either direction, it can affect whether the cells of the heart uh, will contract normally. So we want to keep that within really tight ranges. There are some uh, congenital situations where the ventricular tissue might contract. We can influence uh, potassium. Our diet and lifestyle habits might cause infarction that limits oxygen delivery. But a congenital situation that could describe ventricular contraction is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome where there's an extra loop, an extra electrical pathway in the heart. And you can see the white arrow shown here highlighting that extra pathway where if at the end of the transmission through the ventricles there's this uh, upper pathway connecting back to the AV node, the signal might go through and cause this loop, this feed forward mechanism that primes the ventricles again for a second contraction. Pre-excitation syndrome, it's often called. And you can see that shown here, these last two QRS complexes are obviously different from the normal sinus rhythm. They're characterized by this sort of this wide, long, sloping lead-in phase. They slope right up rather than spontaneously depolarizing. And it's this lead-in phase that's indicative of this feedback loop. Or like we just talked about, part block. If the SA node, the atria, the AV node are all not working or sending signals, the, junk, uh, the, uh, the ventricular foci could take over and initiate contraction. So these are a few options for why ventricular foci might activate. It's very rare. You probably won't see it very often. Um, but FYI. There's one more type of block that I want to just quickly talk about, which is it's sort of lumped in with the ventricular tissue. It's below the level of the AV node. But the problem here is with the conduction system itself. So we, we talked about the AV node. We talked about the muscular tissue, the ventricles itself. But there can also be a, a different flavor of ventricular block. It's called infrahissian block, which literally means infra below hissian, the bundle of hiss below the bundle of hiss, which is in close proximity to the AV node, which gives rise to the bundle branches and is found right at the, uh, the top, the superior portion of the septum. So if there's a block not at the AV node, but just distal to it, that's what we might call infrahissian block. And I'm only bringing it up because we've already seen it today. We just haven't put a name to it yet. So it's a special flavor of ventricular block where the AV node sends the signal through, but the bundle branches, there are two that run through the septum, might be differentially affected. Either the right or the left might disrupt flow. Often it's the left, and that affects how the signal propagates through the ventricle. So the AV node still fires, the signal gets sent, but if there's a delay or a break in the bundle branches, one half of the heart might fire properly while the other is slow to respond. If one bundle branch is disconnected, the signal can't get through, it has to propagate around the ventricles through the tissue. And where that happens in the left bundle branch specifically, left bundle branch block, LBBB, is how um, Morbitt's type 2 develops. 
that regular fixed non-conduction that we saw is typically a result of the bundle branch being disrupted. The P wave fires. There's problems with the, um, the, the bundle of Hiss, the, the, the um, Purkinje Hiss cells that don't allow transmission. And it could simply be how Morbid's type 2 AV block develops. And we can see this. It's kind of interesting to think of how you might see this, because so far we've thought about blocks in a linear top to bottom sense. This type of block is left and right. This is slightly different. And it's interesting to think about how we might observe this in an ECG. So what I'm describing is the little purple explosion on this figure. There's uh, a disruption in the left bundle branch in this case, left side, right side of the heart. So the signal gets through, it propagates down through the right side of the heart normally, but it's slower through the left side of the heart because of this, uh, this block. So what we would observe, if you've got your normal lead to ECG and you're expecting a normal QRS complex, is something like this. Very quick conduction through the right bundle branch. It's doing its job. So you have an initial spike, positive wave towards a positive electrode, gives an upwards deflection. But it's not matched on the left side of the heart. There's this, this slowing or block in the left bundle branch. So this is a lot slower to propagate through the left side of the heart. It's essentially delayed. Right side contracts first, left side contracts second as a result of the left bundle branch block. So right bundle branch first, the left uh, bundle branch contracting the left ventricle is shown with a dashed line. What this would look like on an ECG trace because you, you wouldn't be able to separate them out, they would overlay on top of each other, would be a bimodal QRS complex. Right side first, left side second. So the shape is obviously different from anything we've seen. This is also inherently fairly wide. What does a wide QRS complex tell us again? What happens when the signal spread out? Yeah, exactly. It's not going through the electrical conduction system. It has to pass through the tissue. It does so more slowly. And so the QRS <laughs> complex is wide. It takes longer. So we're viewing it in this normal lead to plane that we're familiar with. But with our 12 lead ECGs, we got more than lead two. Being a left to right blockage, wouldn't it be neat to look at the chest leads that look at the left, center, and right sides of the heart? <coughs> if we do that, and we imagine what it might look like, we can look at the chest leads only, rather than lead two, which goes through the septum that shows the bimodal uh, QRS complex. We can look at either V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, because these look at, at different areas of the heart. In the example with the left bundle branch block, we want to use the left heart chest electrodes. And what that might look like if you look at V5 and V6 is this sort of spiked devil horn appearance, where the QRS complex shows you a very quick right ventricle contraction as it moves down the septum towards the, uh, the electrodes. There's this slower propagation as the signal moves around the left ventricle, and then this quick spike as the left ventricle contracts. It would look like this in V5 and V6. We have quick right ventricular contraction, slower left ventricle contraction, and so the delay of the left ventricle as the signal approaches those electrodes is shown by the second spike. 
to differentiate the spikes, we'll use the, the subscript or the labels R and R1 randomly. But rather than drawing it for you, I'll just show you a couple quick examples where we can observe this in practice, then we'll call it for today. Pretty much class is over anyways. But you can see left bundle branch block here. V5 and V6 were our electrodes of choice. You can see that notched. It's slightly skewed, but there's still a notched characteristic where you have the right and then the left ventricles contracting. The left is the notch. Also notice in V1, V1, uh, V2 and V3, on the right side of the heart, there's a large negative deflection as the activity moves away from those electrodes. So you have this quick depolarization through the conduction system, but the uh, majority of the, act the activity as it spreads through the tissue heads away from the right ventricle, away from V1, V2, away from the right side of the heart towards the left side. Another example, very similar, V5 and V6 have a notched uh, QRS complex. It's more obvious in V6 here. And again, that large negative deflection as we get that, that slower delayed uh, washing of electrical activity away from the right electrode, from the right side of the heart towards the left. I get it. Rhythm is the trickiest topic. This is a lot to cover today. Rhythm is difficult. Um, the other ones have a formula to them. There's a yes or no answer, but rhythm has some interpretation. And so if you were to approach a blank 12 ECG trace, you might ask yourself, how do I figure out the rhythm? What do I look at first? What I would want to see, first and foremost, well, I guess overall, is it regular? Are the features equally spaced out? That's a pretty good first step. A second step, are there P waves? Are there P waves? What do they look like? Where are they in relation to the QRS complex? Is there a PR delay? Is the PR interval increasing? Are there two or three different kinds of P waves? And based on answers to those questions, you can say, okay, well, maybe it's first degree AV block if there's a PR delay. Maybe it's type one second degree AV block if the PR delay gets bigger and then there's a non-conduction. If there's three different types of P waves, maybe it's wandering pacemaker, or maybe it's multifocal atrial tachycardia. But the P waves give you that information. So are there P waves? How quickly are they, are they depolarizing? What's the morphology? What's the shape? Um, that might point you in the right direction. If not, you can look at the QRS uh, complexes. Do they look normal? Are there significant downwards deflections? Are they spaced evenly? Do they always um, match with one P wave? Are they preceded by a P wave? If I'm not seeing anything obvious there, okay, well, let's look at other shapes. Are there multiple uh, foci that are trying to activate? Is there an obvious large sine wave pattern? Is there a uh, small vibration at baseline indicating underlying electrical activity? Um, what's the width of these features? And though these are general, for some reason I decided to put up a very specific example, the one that we just talked about, is there a bundle branch block? Do you see the notched M-shaped QRS complex in V5, V6? 
like that specific example for bundle branch blocks. You'll see specific examples for PR intervals in uh, type 1 and type 2 AV block. You'll see specific patterns for the shapes of P waves in multifocal atrial tachycardia. This is just a specific example uh, of a, a condition you might observe. So there's a lot. Yeah, question. Um, for insertion points at 12 and 18 to uh, that bundle branch uh, block, mm -hmm. um, the right piece that's close to the left on the end is um, higher than the, the first piece. So is that just like another characteristic of that piece that's important? Uh, I think no, because this is drawn out. And in this real life example, the left peak is lower. So the left peak is, is here. The left, um, left ventricle is here. The right ventricle is there. So it's lower in the physical example. And it's just drawn on here. It could be higher. It could be lower. Um, whether it's higher or lower simply dictates or is dictated by how quickly the electrical activity is moving and in what direction. Is it right in line with the electrode, in which case big deflection? Is it just angled off of the electrode, in which case less of a deflection? So it can change. The, um, the M shape is really what you should focus on. There's notches and it has this obvious M shape. 